Let's go to God in prayer. Father, bless us now as we go into your word. May your spoken word find fertile ground in our hearts and minds that we would be both hearers and doers of your word to receive the truths that you have for us and then live those truths out to your glory and for the good of others. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. So I think most of you would testify that by the time you get to Christmas Day, it's all downhill. The most stressful part of the holiday is over. Shopping. Right? That, that shopping list. That list that you either put together anally on paper or some of you put together a shopping spreadsheet, right? Or for many of you, it's something in your mind. You just think about those few people that you want to buy something for and you go shopping. And, and, and man, I mean, you, you want to make sure you get everybody covered in that shopping list. Just yesterday, um, I met a, a friend of mine over here and we were talking outside of church and somebody rode by and they blew the horn. And then they sent me a text message later on saying, hey, pastor, that was me uh, going by and blowing the horn. And so I said, well, you should have stopped and spoke. They said, oh, no, we was on our way to the mall. Had to pick up some last minute stuff. Right. And for a lot of people, the stress didn't end until the last store closed last night. And some of you are already planning how to repurpose the gift that you're going to get or you've received. How to upgrade it, trade it in, take it back, wrong size, get the color you like or whatever it is, right? Well, have you ever had anybody on your shopping list that was just hard to shop for? I mean, just the person that you just like, no matter what you thought, you're like, I don't know what to get the person. Now, typically a person that's hard to shop for, there are one of two reasons why they're hard to shop for. First, you can't think of anything that they don't already have. Right? So you're thinking, you're thinking, you're like, nah, they already had that. Nah, they, they already got that. Or especially a person that always just gets what they want to get. So they don't leave anything for you to buy around Christmas. Or the second problem is, Whatever they like or want or need, you can't afford to get them, right? So you know what they want, but you just don't have Bentley budget. You got Yugo money, right? Um, I used to struggle with that when I was a kid, and especially shopping for my grandparents because my grandparents, in my mind, had everything they needed. And I loved them so much, and I wanted to do so much for them, but I didn't have the money to do what I wanted to do because, man, I was just a kid. So, you know, their present was going to be limited to Old Spice, uh, Gina Tay, you know, or Jeanne Tay, as we would like to say, uh, or maybe English leather or something like that, right? Because I didn't have a lot of money. As a matter of fact, I mean, I wish that they were around today just so I could do something special for them, you know, send them on a trip or do something for them that they had always dreamed about doing. Well, let me ask you a question. As you were busy shopping and you were running around and you were checking your list to see who was naughty and nice to you over this last year, did you put God on your shopping list? Like, was there ever a time when you were running in to needlessly marked up or Saks Fifth Avenue or you were going to Walmart or Target or uh, maybe Best Buy? Did you ever check your list and see, now, what am I going to get for God? You see, if the criteria to buy somebody a gift is they've been good to me or they've done something for me, then God certainly should be on the list. I mean, think about it for a moment. Uh, The word of God says in Psalm 145, verse 9, the Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. Matthew 5:45 says, "In that way you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike." 
So whether you are good or evil, whether you are saint or sinner, God has been good to everybody and deserves consideration for a present. John 3, 27 says, John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, for what gives you the right to make such a judgment? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? What are you going to give to God this Christmas? See, the truth is God is really a tough person to shop for because the scriptures say in Psalm 50, beginning at verse 10, that every animal in the forest belongs to God and the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him. As a matter of fact, in verse 12, the Lord says, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you because I own the world and everything in it. Well, when it came to how to properly respond to the goodness of God displayed in our lives, no one articulates this question and answers it better than the psalmist in Psalm 116. In Psalm 116, verse 12, the psalmist says, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I mean, if you're thinking about putting God on your shopping list and you're going to buy God a present, that's the question to ask. What will I give to God for all his benefits towards me? First of all, let's establish God has been good. That's why the psalmist says all of his benefits, all of those things that are positive, all of those things that are both edifying and empowering and equipping, everything that I need to become all that God wants me to be, I get it from God. And he says, based on what God has done for me, he says that warrants a response of thanksgiving. So what shall I render to God? What should I give back to God in response to what God has given for me? Today, for a few moments, I want to talk to you from the thought, what to give to the God who has everything. What to give to the God who has everything. Now, last week, as we were preparing for this Christmas celebration, we talked about the unspeakable gift, the gift too wonderful for words that the Lord has given to us. But while we're busy trying to give to other people and or look at what other people have given to us, very rarely do we think about what we should give to God. And if there's any day that we should think about what we're going to give to God, it should be on this day. If you have your outlines, would you say amen? If you need an outline, raise your hand and the ushers will get one to you. Three things I want you to see today out of Psalm 116 as we talk about what to give to the God who has everything. Here's the first thing. Number one, you must give God your person. When you talk about giving to the God who has everything, start by giving God your person. Look at verse 12. 13 and 16. Psalm 116. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Look under 1A. The first thing you need to present to God, you need to present yourself in the form of salvation. You need to seek salvation from the Lord. The psalmist says, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will make real my relationship with God. You can't start anywhere else and have a right relationship with God until you get the issue of salvation straight. He's not the man upstairs. He's not the big guy. He's not the grand potentate of the universe. You have to have a relationship with him as your heavenly father. You have to have it through his son, Jesus Christ. Look at John 5, 24. Let's read it together. 
I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. And salvation is not only a salvation from eternal damnation, but salvation can also materialize as deliverance from difficult situations. In other words, when God wants to save you, he saves you eternally, but that does not preclude him from saving you along your earthly journey. For somebody in here who does not know Jesus, you need to know Jesus in the pardon of your sins. But for somebody else who knows Jesus already, you need to make a recommitment to him of the fact that while he saved you, he's the one that keeps you saved. But watch this. The psalmist doesn't stop stop there. The psalmist says, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord, but go to B. Verse 16, he says, not only do I want to drink of the cup of salvation, but I want to give service to others. Oh, Lord, verse 16 says, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maid servant. You have loosed my bonds that I have literally been set free to do what to serve God you will see me in service for you now here's the problem there are many who will acknowledge and know that we ought to accept Christ in terms of salvation but what we fail to realize is service is a necessary appendage to salvation. James says it like this, your faith without works is dead. You have a saving faith, but the evidence that you have a saving faith should be displayed in your serving faith. We ought to see your sanctification played out in your commitment to the Lord. The psalmist says, I will render unto the Lord by drinking of the cup of salvation and serving God. Watch this. It's important for us to understand that before you start with anything else or go anywhere else, your person needs to be given to God. But you don't stop with your person. When we talk about what to give to the God who has everything, we give him our person, but watch number two. Secondly, we are to give him your possessions. You must give God your possessions. Verse 14, Psalm 116, I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Go down to verse 18. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting is in verse 14 and in verse 18, the same phrase is repeated. There's a simple basic principle of hermeneutics called the law of repetition. And whenever you see something repeated in a short time frame or in a small window, it's letting you know that this is a message of importance that God wants you to get. He says two times, I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Now, the paying of vows was made by the beneficiary of the goodness of God in their life. It was the proper response to the goodness that God had made based on the promises that the person who received the blessings had given. Let me give you an example. How many times when you were down did you make a promise to God? You remember when you said, Lord, if you let me out of this, I promise you ain't never got to worry about me again. Lord, if this test come back negative, I'm getting too personal now, huh? No, no, no. You said if that test come back negative, Lord, you ain't got to ever worry about me again. I promise you, Lord. 
When you were sick, you were all flat on your back. You said, Lord, if you ever let me get on my, my feet, you ain't got to ever worry about me. I promise, Lord, I'm going to be in church every week. When you were broke, bust, busted, and disgusted, you said, Lord, boy, look, Lord, if I ever get any money in my pocket, you ain't got to ever worry about me giving again. Lord, I'm gonna, I promise you, I'm going to give my tithes, Lord. And the Lord says you were eager to make the vow when times were hard. Are you as enthusiastic about paying your vow when times are good? In other words, are you willing to make good on the commitment you made to God? Why? My grandfather said your word should be your bond. Right now, there are those who will tell you don't enter into any business arrangement without a contract. But somebody in here knows folk write contracts to get out of them. They write contracts with loopholes and you can't trust people who are untrustworthy even with a contract. But my grandfather said your word should be your bond. Well, listen, your word to God should be your bond. If you told God that, God says, when are you going to make good on your word? Look at verse 14. Make thankfulness, to sacri- make thankfulness your sacrifice to God and keep the vows you made to the most high. First Chronicles 29, verse 14. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. O Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in your uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. Lord, test the heart and have pleasure in my uprightness. You know when God checks the integrity of your giving? God checks the integrity of your giving when you learn how to give and make good on the promise you made. Because if you make a promise and you don't keep it, then your giving is without integrity. And here's the problem for some of us. We don't understand that God never expects us or asks us to give something that he doesn't know we already have. Let me give you an example. So I was preaching in Barbados, uh, Bahamas one day. I was preaching in Bahamas and um, man, the Lord gave me this illustration. And so I asked the pastor if he could give me two men that I could trust two men and I needed them to do something for me. And so the two brothers came in the back before service and I gave them each a $50 bill. I gave them each a $50 bill and I said, now listen, I said, in the sermon, I'm going to ask for two people to come up right away and give me $50. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask them to give me a $50 bill and when I ask, I need the two of you all to jump up and give it to me. And they said, no problem. So we go out, go through the service. I get up to preach. I get in that point in the sermon. I said, now listen, I said, I need two people in here to give me $50 right now. I need two people to give me $50. And the one brother jumped up and ran up and gave me the $50. And his wife looked at him like, where you get that from? (laughs) But the other brother stood still. He never moved. So I said it again. I said, all right, I need one more person. I need one more person to give me $50. I need a $50 bill, one more person to give me $50. He didn't move. Finally, I walked down. I stood in front of him. I said, I need another person who has $50 to give me a $50 bill. The brother said, oh, oh, he went in his pocket and gave me, now I guess he forgot, he, I gave it to him, right? He gave me the $50. His wife looked at him like he was crazy. <laughs> Want to know where he got a $50 bill from? 
Now, after they gave it to me, I said to him, now, let me tell you why I kept asking for the money. I kept asking for the money because I gave them $50 before church. So I knew they had it. And I had given them instructions to give it back to me when I asked for it. So they couldn't sit there and tell me they didn't have it because I already knew I gave it to them. All they had to do was respond and bring it back to me when I asked for it because I gave it to them before I asked them to give it to me. Some of y'all looking at me strange. Listen, when we talk about giving God your possessions, you need to understand it's God's by ownership, it's yours by stewardship, and when God asks you to give back to him, he's not asking you to give something that he doesn't know you already have. Now, you may have spent it in another way, but that doesn't mean it's pleasing to God because he gave it to you, expecting you to give him back a portion of what he's given to you. That, that's, why, that's why the Bible says we are to give him our possessions. But don't miss the order because you really can't give him your possessions until you give him your person. And for some of you, the reason you have trouble giving of your substance is because you have not given him yourself. And it's not until he gets all of you that he can expect to get any of what you have. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to go down to verse 11. Actually, let's start at verse 9. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Here is my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly, and give according to what you have, not what you don't have. God says, you started off on fire. What happened to the flame? You started off with this big commitment. God says, where's the commitment? So if you're going to give to the God who has everything, you need to give of your person. Secondly, you need to give of your possessions. Here's the third thing. Number three, to give to the God who has everything, you must give God your praise. You must give God your praise. I'm almost embarrassed to show it to you. It's right here in the text. Look at verse 17, Psalm 116. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Now in verse 13, 15 and 16, he talks about giving God your person. In verse 14, he talks about giving God your possessions. But in verse 17, he shifts to giving God your praise. Now watch this. Don't miss the order. You can't properly give God praise until you first give him your possession. And your praise has no integrity if your praise has not been preceded by your possessions. He says, give God your praise. Now, the word for thanksgiving there is the Hebrew word todah. If you're in Israel today and somebody does something for you, you will hear them respond todah, which simply means thanks. Thanksgiving, the giving of thanks, being thankful, being appreciative. And it was used to describe a group of worshipers who were giving a thanks offering to the Lord. It's a public testimony 
recognizing God's goodness to you. And the more you recognize you don't deserve it, the more likely you are to say it. But then watch in verse 19, Psalm 116. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Now, that word for praise there is the Hebrew word halal. It's where we get hallelujah from, that first part of that phrase, halal. And halal means to shine, to make a show of, or to boast about. Uh, It's also translated in some locations to clamor foolishly or to rave about or to celebrate excessively. Now, excessive celebration is not a negative. It just speaks to the degree of celebration you give. And he says, when you talk about giving God praise, there ought to be some halal praise in there. There ought to be some boasting about your praise. Uh, Let me see if I can make it real plain. All of us are familiar with sports teams having fans. And if you watch the football games this weekend, you will see fans showing their support for their team. Now, the idea of fans comes from and serves really as an abbreviated term for fanatic. Fanatic was not a negative term when it was first created or used in its classic sense. A fanatic is somebody who would rave about something or somebody in an excessive way. They just cut it short to fans. So, for example, if you watch the Green Bay Packers, Green Bay Packer fans will wear them crazy cheese heads. And they will wear a cheese head anywhere because they have no problem letting you know that they are a fan of the Green Bay Packers. They are going to clamor excessively about the Green Bay Packers. Dallas Cowboy fans are unashamed, unashamedly bold about being a fan of the Cowboys. And they're going to let you know anywhere at any time that they are a Cowboys fan. They're going to wear that star proudly. But shame on us when we are more fanatical about a football team than we are about our Savior. Listen, I'm not saying you can't cheer for your favorite team, but your cheer for your team should never be louder than your cheer for your savior. Monday night football, Cowboys are going to play the lines and some of y'all going to be hollering and screaming at the television like somebody can hear you. But you'll sit quietly by when it comes to worship. And talk about I'm not I'm not loud. I'm not demonstrative. I'm pastor. I'm very introverted in my praise. I'm not too dignified and sophisticated for that. But you're going to scream and holler about where a ball goes. He says, praise the Lord. It's it's a command. It's an expectation that God has. Psalm 50, verse 23, the sacrifice that honors me, God is talking, is a thankful heart. Obey me and I, your God, will show my power to save. Hosea 14, 2, return to the Lord and say, please forgive our sins, accept our good sacrifices of praise instead of bulls. Listen, he knew you could give him a bull and still not give him yourself. He said, I wanted evidence, not in stuff, but in self. 
Jonah 2, 9, but I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise and I will fulfill all my vows for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Hebrews 13, 15, let's read it together. So through Jesus, let us always offer to God our sacrifice of praise coming from lips that speak his name. And that command to praise God is independent of where you are, who's around you, or the opinions of other people. See, I was at a church one time and uh, I was visiting and, and somebody in the back hollered out, praise the Lord. And everybody turned around and looked to see who the visitor was. Because they knew members knew better than to act like that. We, we don't want to be offensive. We don't want anybody to look at us when in actuality our praise has nothing to do with who's around us. It has everything to do with who in, lives inside of us. So what will I give to the God who has everything? Well, I think all of us would agree if you know Jesus You've experienced a once in a lifetime, one of a kind love. And if you have received and experienced and have hold of a one of a kind, once in a lifetime love, then you should give him a once in a lifetime, one of a kind gift. You know, when you were little and you ran down and you saw that Christmas tree and you saw the presents under that tree, the bigger the box, the more exciting it was. You remember when you saw a great big box? Somebody said, that's your box. You said, me? That's my box. Because the bigger the box, you figured the more valuable the gift. And it wasn't until you got older that you realized that the little small boxes cost a whole lot. Well, here's what I want you to do. Ushers, help us today. I want everybody to think about how good God has been to you. And as you think about how good God has been to you, think about the most valuable present you can give to God. The most precious gift you can give to the Lord. It's not money. It's nothing that you can purchase in a store. The most precious gift you could give is the gift of yourself. So you know what I want you to do? I want you to think about a great big box that's big enough for you to get in. And, and, and get somebody to wrap that box up with you inside of it. And that bow that you're getting right now, put that bow on yourself and say, I'm giving myself to God. Now, I know some of you have on some fancy garments, but it won't harm your garment. Just pull a little, little, little paper off and stick it right on yourself. One, one of the brothers didn't put it on his jacket. He had a very clean head, so he just put it right on his head. And just say to God, God, I give myself to you. In the midst of me worrying about what I'm going to give to other people and worrying about what somebody's going to give to me, am I going to get the present I want? I want to encourage you today to be the present that God wants. You see, the truth of the matter is we're supposed to be celebrating his birthday. So if anybody should get a gift today, <laughs> it should be him. You know, I'd have been mad if everybody was talking about getting a gift and wanted me to give them a gift on my birthday. Because if their birthday wasn't December the 18th, you wait until your birthday. That's when we make a fuss about you coming into life. But today we celebrate the advent. And we celebrate the coming of our Lord. And we give ourselves 
as the most valuable gift we can give to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we bless you today for the opportunity to give to you that we can present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, which is our reasonable service. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to worship you and to give you something that's unique because we have been uniquely and wonderfully created in your image. There's no other like us. And you died for us to help us become all that we can. So we ask you to bless as only you can. And we pray that our gifts would be acceptable in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.